Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Embedded within the essence of China, civilization has been and still is a fundamental aspect of a nation's identity. From the origins of Chinese civilization to its eventual globalization and influence on modern society, what's the essence of Chinese civilization? And how is this enduring legacy driving China's development today? To help us answer these questions and more, I'm glad to be joined by David Ferguson, Ordinary Chief English Editor at Foreign Languages Press, CICG, who is also a recipient of the Chinese Government Friendship Award and the Special Book Award of China. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Uh, David, you know, if you look uh, at these uh, four civilizations, the Chinese civilization, uh, Sumeria, and the Indus Valley, and the ancient Egypt, uh, I wonder, you know, how do you account for this period of, you know, where the four great kingdoms reached the state uh, at roughly the same time? Is this just a coincidence, or is there a scientific explanation for this? Well, yes, that's a very interesting question. I would say, and I'll come back to this point in a minute, uh, I would say it's definitely not a coincidence. I mean, if you look on the internet, you can find all sorts of zany theories about alien seeding, and um, I don't ascribe to them myself. Although I wouldn't wholly write off the idea that something happened at that time. Because if you look at the mythologies, the Roman mythology, Greek mythology, uh, Chinese mythology, they're all very complex, and they're too complex to be have been purely invented. So that obviously some effort on the part of humans to explain some events that happened, to rationalize some event that happened, and also there are points of commonality in ancient mythologies. So I would, while not ascribing to the alien seeding theory, I would say it's not a coincidence. Something definitely did happen. Mm -hmm. Something did happen. Uh, let's take a closer look at the Chinese civilization here. Uh, not long ago, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, gave a speech on Chinese civilization. Uh, he pointed out the Chinese civilization had these uh, prominent characteristics of uh, continuity, innovation, unity, inclusiveness, and peace. Uh, so I wonder, you know, what's your understanding of these five uh, uh, prominent and outstanding features of Chinese civilization? Well, uh, I think the most important aspect is continuity. And that is something that President Xi regularly emphasizes. And what he's talked about, in fact, he's talked about two combinations. A combination of the modern and the traditional. And specifically, he talks about combining China's, the values of China's ancient culture with Marxism. And he also talks about the combination between theory and practice. And I think that that is a very vital aspect of President Xi's whole thinking in terms of governance. Now, if you look at the combination of Marxism and ancient Chinese culture, one of the clearest manifestations um, of that is in the people-centered philosophy. Because all the way back to Confucius, China was talking about pursuing the common good for all. And that's how it was uh, expressed at that time. And one of the most important aspects of China's system is continuity. From my perspective, one of the great strengths of China's system in comparison with the Western political system is that word continuity. Uh, for the whole period of the PRC, we have had, to a large extent, continuing themes in governance. And it comes down to the, it comes down to the structure of China's political system. Because China's political system is based on what I call three Cs, which is cooperation and coordination and consensus. It's not based on the kind of opposition to politics of Western political systems. And when you have, uh, when you have coordinated governance, uh, when you have cooperation in governance, which again is manifested in very specific things like the two sessions, and when you're looking to build consensus, then allows you to plan for the long term. And that is what China does. Second centenary goal, 
are a set of, is a, a set of goals to be realized in 2049. That's China looking forward almost 30 years. But if you look back to when the second centenary goal idea first started to be formulated, it was in 1988, I think, at the 13th Congress. That's China looking forward 60 years. So you have this very important thread of continuity in Chinese politics that allows leaders to make long-term plans, that allows the administration and the government to pilot ideas, to test them out once they've worked, to roll them out, and they can look forward in that long term. So continuity is one of the most important aspects of China's civilization. Well, as the President Xi said, uh, you know, those five prominent characteristics uh, fundamentally determine that China will follow its own path in terms of development. Uh, so, you know, it, it reminds me of you know, Chinese stress, you know, often they stress very much about the Chinese characteristics of socialism or modernization with the Chinese uh, uh, characteristics, let's say. Uh, so it's more stress about its independence or, you know, sometimes the Chinese uh, diplomats would say every country will follow their own path based on their own national conditions. So that does make sense. Yes, I think it makes entire sense. Uh, the problem, the problem that we have at the moment is that the West has a voice that is too loud and the West has very little tolerance for other people's systems. Part of that stems from the fact they don't really understand themselves. It doesn't occur to the developed West that their system cannot simply be implanted on other countries, that their system grew out of their historical experience and it grew out of a historical experience that cannot be repeated nowadays. Um, so respect for other people's systems and respect for other people's choices is really important. There is almost no example of a small, poor, underdeveloped country that became a Western-style democracy and as a result went on to become successful and prosperous. There aren't any because the West didn't become prosperous by becoming a democracy. All these Western countries, they became democracies. They created their political system after they were already rich and prosperous. So you cannot bolt one system onto another system, onto, onto another country and expect it to function. I think that China's respect for other people's choices and other people's countries is of fundamental importance. And what I think is very important right now is that it's apparent that many other countries are seeing that much more clearly. You have the situation in Ukraine, which has led to polarization across the, uh, across the, the whole international community. And what's interesting is the guys with the loud voices, the guys who've always been heard before, the guys who've always been obeyed before are finding that it's no longer working that way. A lot of people now, a lot of countries, which in the past were very much in the Western fold, are now turning to China, they're turning to Russia, they're turning to BRICS, they're turning to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and they're saying, show us a better model, show us a different model, we actually want to find other ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about inclusiveness. Uh, it also, I think, uh, you know, reminds people of, uh, for example, one of the Chinese initiatives, like a uh, global security initiative. Uh, part of that, uh, you know, initiative stresses on this uh, inclusiveness. Uh, you know, the concern uh, for not only, you know, country A's uh, national security, but also that of country B or country C. Uh, that should also be taken into account so we can build a inclusive, uh, inclusive society instead of e exclusive uh, like alliance or against certain countries uh, if we truly want to pursue, uh, you know, uh, pursue peace and stability. Yeah, you raise a very good point there because when I spoke about inclusiveness, I spoke about it purely from the domestic perspective, things like people's people centered development, but it's also very important in terms of China's external relations with the world. And you can look back to uh, ancient Chinese history, and you have that Silk Road that played such a vitally important part of overall human development. That was um, that was part of China's means 
for building inclusive relationships with the rest of the world. And what's obviously interesting is that in the modern era, when China started to, to, to have problems in terms of its development, it was at precisely that time when it stopped being inclusive, when it stopped looking out at the world, when it became very internally focused. So you have this thread of inclusiveness, which has always been important, both important because it was respected and then important because it wasn't respected. And that comes very much through today. You spoke about, you spoke about yeah. inclusiveness in terms of global security. Every country has a right to feel secure within its own borders. Every country has a right to have its interests respected. Every country has a right to have its right to development respected. And I think that China's approach very much reflects that. So it's not only inclusive in terms of making sure that Chinese people share in the fruits of development, it's also inclusive in the fact that it looks out to the world and tries to make sure that, the, that everybody has a right to a voice and a right to a share. And the Belt and Road Initiative is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Well, David, earlier you mentioned about, uh, you know, the traditional Chinese culture, uh, you know, we see Asian efforts to achieve balance or harmony between humanity and the universe, the emperor and his uh, people. Uh, I wonder, you know, where did this concept come from? You know, how did it form in China? Yeah, well, it's a very good question as to where it came from. I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how ancient civilizations had two potential paths to choose. They could become very ritualistic um, uh, and stagnant, or they could become free thinking and open. Now, why the Romans, why the Greeks, why the Chinese chose one path and other civilizations chose a different path is a very difficult question to answer. But there's no doubt at all about it that once that idea took root, the idea of harmony, um, then it played an essential role in the, in the development of China. And the harmony between the emperor and people is an interesting one, for example. Uh, different, a different idea from the, the, the ancient Greek ideas of democracy. Um, Confucius, he very much was an ex an exponent of, of the idea of harmony. Um, and harmony, if you can build it, is, uh, is a very successful model. The fundamental problem with harmony is that it relies on rule by virtue. It relies on the ruler having a strong moral compass uh, and being a good person. And of course, through China's history, uh, there have been great emperors, but there have also been weak and corrupt emperors. So on its own, rule by virtue doesn't work. And again, I think modern China uh, and President Xi in his ideas of governance, he understands that. And he understands that rule by virtue will not work on its own. You also have to have rule of law. And he talks about both of these things. So I think that the modern expression of harmony is uh, is in reflected in uh, in whole process people's democracy, in the people being the masters of the country, and in law based governance. Governance is based on the constitution and laws to protect people where there are weaknesses and rule by virtue. It's like a galaxy taking in more and more <laughs> elements throughout history, not just people, but also knowledge and, 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 uh, and ideas. And um, it's what makes China today. Study another civilization and compare it with your own roots. You will understand your own roots much better. Chinese civilization was formed from many different cultural and philosophical traditions. And this diversity has helped Chinese culture appreciate and understand today's many global issues.
What experiences that we can draw from China's long and rich history, and what are the similarities and differences between Chinese and Western philosophies? To help us answer these questions, I'm honored to be joined by German philosopher Dr. David Batosh, Distinguished Research Fellow at Beijing Normal University in Zhuhai. In the Chinese civilization, uh, probably people will uh, think of the two important rivers, Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Uh, as you said, they are important to the formation, I guess, and evolution of the Chinese civilization. Tell us more about that. Oh, that's an amazing topic. Um, uh, I would say it's uh, China uh, and Chinese civilization as, as it developed and later on, on the basis of various starting points alongside these rivers, um, is very special because if we look at these other ancient civilizations you were mentioning, ancient Egypt has only one river, right? Um, uh, uh, Mesopotamia also is a two river civilization, the Euphrates and Tigris, but the rivers are uh, much closer to each other. So um, it's not just, it's not such a, such a vast uh, region that is characterized by these rivers and they are also not as long and as as massive uh, kind of streams than than the two main uh, rivers in china uh, and uh, if, if we talk about the the indic civilization um, as arnold j toynbee uh, called it uh, you see there was the indus river valley civilization and then there was this um, ecological catastrophe and then this civilization fell into a dark age for 1,000 years, and then they moved to the Ganges River uh, uh, in, 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 in the eastern, uh, more east. Um, and the Ganges River Valley became the new center of, 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 of this uh, of, of this uh, South Asian Indic uh, or Hindu, later Hinduistic uh, or uh, yeah, civilization, which were predominantly also influenced by, by, by these religions and philosophies of Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, and, and you see there's a breakdown, right? And it's not two rivers at the same time. And ancient Greece is not a river civilization, right? It's it's a Mediterranean island. Uh, it's a very special context island civilization. So so China, uh, Chinese civilization has, uh, in China, we have two vast rivers, uh, uh, rivers with highly uh, developed uh, city states that started to uh, develop uh, particular forms of uh, sophisticated communication. They exchanged their uh, views. And then, of course, uh, Chinese writing came about in the Huanghe River region, which then, and also particular forms of ritualistics and rituals related to, to uh, political uh, forms, systems. Uh, you know, David, you mentioned about the you know, continuity of the Chinese civilization. I guess you know if you want to keep this uh, civilization or whatever culture you know uh, continue as long as you know thousands of years. Of course, at the, during this course, probably uh, it needs to be uh, open. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to be innovative uh, to accommodate you know uh, new development or new things you know uh, changes of the times. Uh, so tell us more about you know how you know how innovative probably the Chinese culture, Chinese civilization has been to accommodate all mm -hmm. those changes you know, mm -hmm. throughout history and, to, okay. to, and mm -hmm. then to continue until today. Yeah, of course. I mean, if, if we take into account uh, world history here and, and compare civilizations, China is, is of course, one of the most uh, innovative uh, large-scale civilizations. There also have been others, right? The, the Roman civilizations, the, the right. Indian civilizations, they all have provided inputs, new ideas, and they all did something uh, that others couldn't do in the same way or not as uh, as far advanced as the others. And this was also the starting uh, point for, for the interchange and trade and exchange, a peaceful exchange, the starting point of the Silk Road. And uh, the Chinese people, they are they were known early on uh, in in uh, in ancient Greece as the Serike, which means the silk people, right? So so the Chinese uh, invention of of silk uh, uh, influenced uh, the, the the Greeks, the Romans, the everyday life. I just uh, visited in uh, an, an exhibition in Shenzhen about uh, the um, excavations in Pompeii, and they and there was a painting of uh, some kind of, I think it was some Roman deity, but you could see the, the clothes 
that this female deity was wearing, that it, I, I suppose it was silk because you could see through, right? It was very uh, refined form of text, text, uh, textile technology. So the idea uh, must have been influenced uh, from uh, yeah what what they received by by means of trade. China has invented so much a paper, of course, you name it, a paper money, modern banking. <laughs> Uh, 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 so many, so many things. Uh, porcelain, uh, the, the the China where we call it China where it's very porcelain right. or tea to drink tea. And of course, if you if you look uh, at the history, uh, also these Chinese inventions they have influenced the way of thinking, the the the, the products um, uh, of of people everywhere. And uh, also, uh, more importantly, I would add here the history of European economy, right? Uh, they have studied Chinese economic principles in the 18th century, the uh, so-called Wu Wei economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of Wu Wei of having competition, uh, free competition in, in, the, in the economic sector to, uh, and, and then uh, let this competition play out, uh, led to the idea, uh, it was transferred by Jesuit uh, priests to, to France, it, it, uh, it found its way to the head, to the mind of François Quesnay, uh, uh, econo uh, the first Western eco European uh, economist who, who, who came up with this term laissez-faire, which influenced uh, the history of Western capitalism as well. And, and the, this input enabled uh, European countries to grow bigger, right? Uh, the manufacture is an idea that they adopted from China in the 18th century became a uh, a basis for the later industrialization, right? First, you have to have manufacture, and then you can have uh, more evolved uh, technological stages of production. Uh, so many things. Um, German philosophy, of course, right? Uh, in, in my case, uh, uh, the uh, one of the most important thinkers, uh, Christian Wolf, the forerunner of Immanuel Kant, was deeply influenced by Confucian thought. And uh, he it, it inspired him in his thoughts about morality and and uh, society uh, very much inspired him and became a basis for uh, sometimes also an implicit basis, not always outspoken, but an implicit basis for the further development in German uh, philosophy context. So uh, so so the Chinese innovativeness is out of the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see it return for over the last 20 years, China is getting more and more innovative in various sectors. Um, uh, and I hope that China can also um, st uh, yeah, start a, a, ho a holistic, I would say a holistic and um, innovation, not just in some uh, sectors at the moment, it's, it's very technology based and science direct, but also uh, I assume and uh, I'm, I'm sure that there will be also more and more cultural mm -hmm. in a soft uh, area. <laughs> innovation in the future. So that's that's very interesting to witness and, and right. it's a privilege to see. <laughs> right. David, lastly, uh, because of the time limit here, we, and, you know, we talked about, uh, I guess, you know, along with uh, being innovative, uh, you know, a, a civilization has to be also inclusive because of, uh, you know, the development uh, uh, the changes, you know, like in China, you have different religions, of course, and, um, I guess the similarity in other countries too. You have different ethnic groups, you have to accommodate, you have to be inclusive, and then continue to develop along uh, with each other into this uh, you know, one civilization. Yeah, I, I think um, China, if you look back at the history, I already mentioned this uh, point of, of a fusion characteristic here, which dates back really to, to earliest times, uh, 3000 years that you can think of the beginnings of the Zhou uh, dynasty, for example, this element of, of, of integrating people from various regions, um, despite maybe differences in language or, or, or other differences, uh, cultural differences uh, on the basis of shared values or shared customs, um, is actually a great strength uh, in, in China, throughout Chinese history. And China is already, uh, China started as a multicultural uh, setting in, in the Bronze Age. And, 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 and there's this giant, I would say, it's, it's, it's like a galaxy taking in more and more <laughs> elements throughout history, not just people, but also knowledge and, 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 uh, and ideas and um, it's what makes China today, right? All the, the ability to integrate, to absorb, 
And I think um, in the in the context, in the world context, uh, we should we should find a common goal uh, amongst all the civilizations of humanity. I would propose. I mean, um, I'm thinking a lot about um, uh, the biosphere at the moment. If, if you look at the biosphere, there are some uh, species on Earth. They exist for 500 million, 500 million years, right? What are we, right? Maybe we, we should set our goals straight. Maybe we should tr strive to become more long-lasting as a species. And therefore, we have to work together, right? We have to, uh, to, to start to share the work. That's what I learned from a Chinese philosopher named Moze, by the way. <laughs> share the word work share the word as well, the work and also the outcome justly to have a long term sustainable existence, which is the wisdom of agricultural civilization. And of course, this um, uh, importance of, of integration cannot be overstated. But of course, you can also only integrate something if you are aware of your own tradition, right, mm -hmm. if, of your own background. And I prefer personally, in my life, um, I, I have made the experience that it's very good to study another civilization and compare it with your own roots. You will understand your own roots much better because you have something to compare, but you will also be able to absorb and understand other roots, other civilizations, and to expand and to develop um, a, a more humanitarian uh, understanding, global understanding uh, in, a, in, in, all, in regard to this multi-civilizational right. um, yeah. complex, right? And also that's the, the way how we grow up and how we grow as a civilization or as a nation. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guest, David Batosh. You can also find us on the CGT app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.